This video titled From Helpless to Empowerment has six segments in it. So the first segment is symptom management through medication. The second segment is salt baths and hot water bottles. The third segment is incorporating massage into both the Epsom sea salt or the salt baths and the hot water bottles. Segment four is movement, both yoga and impulse movement. Segment five is rebounding on a mini trampoline. And this video ends with segment six, which is about the beamer. So thank you and welcome. Hmm. Hi everybody. Welcome back. It's a lovely day to be shooting a video here in Marin, California. We've been drenched in like, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight days of rain, 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 rain. And today the sun came out and we decided to take advantage of it and shoot outside. So I'm enjoying the warmer temperature. I'm enjoying the sunlight. And a lot of the green is gone, but there's still quite a bit left and just feeling the air and the breeze and just the life that is in nature. It's nice to reconnect. I never really lose my connection with it, but it's always nice to actually viscerally come out and feel it in my body. So today's the title of today's video is From Helpless to Empowerment. And it's, um, wow. I've done the least amount of planning for this video because it seemed a very difficult one to plan for. So I just kind of trusted my intuition and my video man, Stuart, and my let's see set designer makeup artist hair artist beth alice i just trusted my professional support team creative and artistic to um step in and kind of support me in jumping into the unknown and just uh winging it i always wing it but this is different because this is going to be different than any of the videos you've seen because we're going to be shooting from many different places. I'm going to be doing a lot of demonstrations. So I'm shaking things up a bit today, both literally and figuratively. So I want to take a moment, um, as I often do, to check in and ground myself before I launch into this exciting uh, subject matter from helpless to empowerment. <sighs> I feel the sun hitting my back, my breath in my belly, my mid belly. I can hear some construction off in the far distance. I can hear ever so faintly some birds in the background. <sighs> I feel the breeze hitting my skin. Oh, I hear a little baby crying in the background somewhere. Mm. Oh, my body's just taking in the pleasure of nature in all its elements mm. and the pleasure of breath. Mm. I feel my rear uh, sitting on the stone and my soles of my feet sitting on the stone also, the, the stone that's on the ground. So I have a lot of earthy elements around me, the breeze, the bricks, the stone. Mm. 
And now I think I've settled enough in my body to begin the subject matter for today. So, gosh, three, four months ago, um, well, not that long ago, probably closer to hmm, two or three months ago, uh, I was um, being rushed somewhat regularly to the emergency room in very high level of pain. On a scale of one to 10, I was rating myself at a nine or a nine plus. Uh, I was not able to have bowel movements without excruciating pain. And they had just discovered tumors in both my eyes, big one in my right eye, small one in my left eye, and a tiny, tiny, tiny tumor in the um, lining of my brain. So things did not look good. <laughs> That's an understatement. And to sit out here in nature, see these green trees, to see the outline of the, the skeleton of the tree that just had all its beautiful leaves fall, to feel the sun, to feel my body expand with breath is pretty miraculous. And you might wonder, how did I get here? How, how, did, how did I get here from being rushed to ambulance, by ambulance, uh, to the hospital and unable to have a bowel movement, you know, pain level at nine, tumors showing up in multiple places, how did I end up here? And with energy, vitality, cancer low down, uh, enjoying nature, um, weight and energy coming back. Uh, how, how did I do that? And I'm here to tell you how I did that. So there's many steps. This video is gonna be shot in segments. And the first step, um, first segment um, is, is was, was medication management. Um, these segments are not necessarily in any particular order, but um, they're going to be shot in a certain order. So we're starting with um, medication management. So the first thing is we need to get my, you know, according to the doctors, we need this pain level down. You, I could not sustain myself at a level nine. You no know, human being you know, on a, on a, it, it, it's not, um, it's not conducive to everyday living to have level nine pain. So the first thing we had to evaluate is how can we decrease this pain? And it was a little humbling for me because I, it was recommended that I go on pain medication on a regular basis. Prior to this, I only took the pain medication for me, Percocet, uh, when I felt pain. But it wasn't working. <laughs> the bottom line, just taking it on an as needed basis was not working. It was not doing the job. So the doctors wanted me on a low level baseline and then I could still take it on an as needed basis when the pain would peak. So I had the 12-hour the time-released Percocet that I began that I would take, you know, 7 in the morning and 7 in the evening. And it would release, it releases slowly throughout the 12 hours. So I have a low-level baseline of pain medication in my system 24-7, all the time. Now... Sometimes the pain medication, the low dose, the time release is not enough. And if my pain spikes, then I have the short term um, Percocet, 10 milligrams and five milligrams that I can take as an as needed basis. So basically there's the baseline, the 12 hour baseline medication, slow release, and then now I take the short term on an as needed basis. If the pain, if the um, long term slow release medication is not enough and the pain spikes, 
I can take something on an as-needed basis. So that was the um, first thing that needed to be addressed. Now, I was very resistant to pain medication. It was one of those things where I would say, you know, I would preach, you know, you have to listen to your body and it's not a bad thing to need medication and, you know, it's not necessarily, you know, forever. That's what I would say. But then privately to myself, I'd be like, I would still think of it as a bad thing. You know, I don't want to be on pain medication every day and I wanted to be independent and I still had the message in my brain that medicate, being on medication was bad and being off medication was good. And in an ideally perfect world, you know, of course I would prefer not to be on medication, but I have, I'm healing from widespread metastasized cancer and I'm just finished four weeks of radiation for the eyes and a one radiation treatment for the brain and I'm on chemo. I just finished round six of chemo. So it's not really realistic <laughs> for me to think that I'm not going to need pain medication. Beyond that, it's just a miracle. I forget to acknowledge just the miracle of the fact of how well I'm doing. I mean, it's a miracle that I get out of bed. It's a miracle with the cancer load that I had that I'm turning things around. So if I need a little bit of pain medication to make that happen, I should get down on all hands and knees and say, thank you, God, for creating Percocet. <laughs> thank you for supporting me, Percocet, in this incredible journey. And thank you for making it possible for me to heal and to turn this situation around. That's what I should be saying instead of, why do you need Percocet? Why do you need pain medication? You know, why? Like, hello? <laughs> like, uh, it's, it's, I should really be focusing on the miraculous recovery and just how miraculous it is. Um, you know, my brother and I joke that I forget that I am healing from widespread metastasized cancer and that I'm, uh, and that I'm on chemo, full dose, you know, full dose chemo, round six, and then I just finished radiation. It's like I wake up and I, I get perplexed. Well, why am I so tired? <laughs> why am I, why am I in pain today? It's like hello, <laughs> hello, you know. So, I don't want to focus on those things because. They can seem negative, but I also need to remind myself sometimes so that I'm kinder to myself and I'm grounded in, in realis realistic expectations. And so I can celebrate my miraculous, miraculous life that I'm living when everybody, all the doctors say I should have been dead long ago. I went in for a checkup and to my naturopath oncologist and his, his, um, he works at a clinic and the owner of the clinic is an oncologist who also, who practices both conventional and alternative. And the, um, the conventional oncologist was talking to my oncologist. This is getting confusing. Let me give some names. Um, well, anyway, my, the conventional oncologist was talking to my naturopath oncologist and he said, she's still alive? <laughs> Literally, she's still alive? Because my cancer load was so large, you know, he just assumed by now I would have been dead. And, and then my naturopath oncologist said, not only is she alive, but she's kind of thriving. And it kind of sank in in that moment it's like, I kind of like woke up. It's like, hello, Laura. Like, do you, it put things in perspective for me. So I'm trying really hard now to remember how far I've come and how miraculous it really is. And to start being less judgmental about needing some pain medication. 
whether it's every day, whether it's a hundred times a day, whether it's once a week, whatever it is, and just and to just celebrate the miracle that I can that I can begin to turn this around because again the consensus is she should have been dead a long time ago because I don't like to talk about it but my cancer load was and still is very large even with the improvement I have a large tumor load and that's just the reality I plan to continue to to make it smaller that is my intention that's my goal that's what I intend to do but even right now I mean for a year I carry big tumors around in my abdomen area and that's just the reality of it and it's been hard how does how does one live with these kinds of tumors and that's what I'm here to talk about how I've managed to live on a daily basis under these kinds of conditions and to turn it around so first step was let's get her on some pain medication and then you might say well why is she in pain I mean, I know the obvious. We just said I have wide, I'm have i healing from widespread metastasized cancer, but let's get more specific. I, have an, I had a very, very enlarged liver. The doctor said it used to come down. The liver is right here, and my liver went down like almost to my pubic bone. I mean, it had just pretty much almost taken over my whole torso. And so the enlarged liver pressed against my colon, which pressed against my spleen, and everything was hard and like a rock and rigid. So you can imagine that taking a bowel movement was difficult because nothing could move. <laughs> everything was hard, everything was painful, everything was pressing. So another doctor, when I was in the hospital, recommended steroids because steroids they don't reduce the tumor load but they soften it and really the softening was as important as the reduction so and also increases appetite so there were a lot of positive things there were some minor side effects my feet and ankles swelled and you know I had to I have to, I had to deal with that but the benefits far outweighed the negatives. And so all of a sudden, this area that was hard became soft. S like, and you could push it, and it would, it would feel bouncy. And as, the, as my liver softened, then there was no longer pressure on my colon. So then there was no longer pressure on my spleen. So then all of a sudden, everything was soft and could move. So now I hope you'll excuse my graphicness. It's embarrassing to me. I have to keep talking about bowel movements, but you can imagine this bowel BM trying to move through my colon and everything's rigid and nothing moves and it's hard, and it's, and, but it needs to come through. So I'm screaming and level nine pain. And all of a sudden the liver softened. So the colon softened, so the spleen softened, everything's softening everything can move and all of a sudden the bowel the BM can move <laughs> like all of a sudden there's ease things can go in different angles things can move and so so the first step we address the pain and then the second step was to say well why let's look let's look more specifically why is she in so much pain because she's like this her whole torso is like this it's hard and nothing can move and she has to have bowel movements, all human beings do. So this was a very serious issue. And then <laughs> it gets so complicated because one of the side effects of the pain medication is constipation. <laughs> and now I'm on pain medication every day. And so I'm like, hook, I'm like feeling like discouraged, like does this ever end? You know, it's very, this is a very complex, um, set of circumstances that requires a great deal of consciousness and wisdom to, to navigate because there's so many factors at play. But the good news is that it can be done. That's the most important news. So we've established 
Laura's in pain and we need to we need to give her something for the pain. Now we're looking at well what's causing this pain? At least a big liver and everything is hard. So let's soften things up. And the chemo, so the steroids soften things up and the chemo reduce the size of my liver pretty significantly. So all of a sudden, whoo, things are moving, things are soft, things are things can respond, things there's flexibility. And but now we have the issue I'm taking something that causes constipation, which was which is what causes the pain. So it's that circular, you know, how do I get out of this? And so I needed to let's see. There are um Take stool softeners, Colace. It's not the only stool softener. It's the one that I use. This one is 50 milligrams. It comes in, I think, 50 and a, either 100. It comes in different um, amounts, depending on what your body needs. And a mild laxative, Senna, is very mild. And it's a laxative, so that helps. The stool softener helps soften the stool. So it can, it's not as, uh, it can move more freely through the colon and the laxative helps give the impulse, you know, the energy to move things through. So they're, they have slightly, they work well together. They have slightly different missions. And if the Senna is not enough, Senna is a very, very gentle laxative, then I have Ducalax, which is a stronger laxative. So I only take the Ducalax if I've gone a whole day without a bowel movement, then the next day I might try a Ducalax. So the um, doctors gave me a very set prescription of how much laxative to take, how much stool softener to take. And of course they wanted me to take, you know, the same amount every day. And I threw those directions out the door because I said, um, I need to listen to my body and my body doesn't need the same thing every day. So every day I wake up and I say to my body, hello body, good morning, how are you? What would you, what do you need this morning? And I listen and it changes on a daily basis because you know, one of my, um, when I went to Mexico for the immune therapy, the head doctor there said something that really hit home with me, he said, Cancer is a dynamic illness. And then this part I added. So meaning it's constantly changing and we have to change to meet it if we want to continue healing. So it's not like with cancer, we don't just get, here's the, here's the directions and follow them and you'll heal because it doesn't work like that. We would like it to work like that because that's a, that gives us as humans a secure feeling, but it's not the way cancer works. So we have to tune in and constantly adjust the treatment to match where the illness is, what stage the illness is in. And if we don't do that, then we can't fully heal. So it requires an enormous amount of flexibility and constant tuning in. So if I just followed directions and did the same thing every day, I really couldn't fully heal because I'd be rigid. But if I wake up every day and I check in with my body and I adjust to whatever my body's presenting in that moment and I continue to do that, then there's like a dance going on between me, my body, the illness. And I say like the illness presents and then I adjust. And now I can adjust because I have movement. I adjust to meet it. And then the illness changes again and I adjust again to meet it. And then sometimes I change and the illness or the world can adjust to meet me. The, inter the dance can go both ways. Uh, we can both be leaders. I don't always have to be the follower or the leader, but there's this dance that can take place when there's flexibility and softness in the body. So that, um, it was, really important to me that I didn't just follow the doctor's instructions very literally 
and that I took what they gave me. Basically, I took all the doctor's tools, but I used them my way. <laughs> because um, another big lesson I learned was that I had to, I had to be the captain of the ship, of this healing ship. Because I'm the only person, I have a great team of professionals and medical professionals, an amazing team composed of both conventional and alternative um, practitioners, but nobody has the full perspective except for me. And for a long time I was scared to take that power on because it was scary. Like, I don't want to be responsible for this. Let, let somebody else tell me what to do. Let somebody else be in charge. And I realized I couldn't heal like that, that I had to step in and take the reins and say, I'm steering this ship and I want to steer it. And I'm the only person equipped to steer it. And so when I became more comfortable with my own power, then that really opened the door for me to have a lot more healing options. So I think that is concludes my first segment of this video, which is on medication that's used to shift from helplessness to empowerment. We're going to now move over to the massage table where I'm going to talk about um, the hot, hot water bottles at, for my um, next segment and then I think we're going to go into rebounding which is jumping on a mini trampoline so you can take a break if you want but uh, please come back because there's more fun to be had thank you okay welcome to segment two of from helplessness to empowerment so we spent the first segment talking about various types of medications and then you might be wondering, well, isn't there something else I can do besides pop a pill? And fortunately, the answer is yes. There are many things you can do besides pop a pill. And that's what I'm going to explore in this segment. We're going to talk about um, salt baths, Epsom salt baths, and Dead Sea salt baths. And we're going to talk about um, hot water bottles and massage. So to start with the salt baths, they, the Epsom salt is good for um, relaxing and detoxification. So helping if you're um, healing from cancer and you're killing cancer, these things have to have a way to leave your body. And the salts help, they call that detoxing. You can detox from heavy metals, you can anything, many things that are not supposed to be in the body that don't support the body's health. When you're trying to get that stuff to leave the body, they call that detox. And the salts help with the detox. The Dead Sea salts have um, special properties. There are 10, ten um, elements that are in the Dead Sea that are not found in any other body of water in the entire world. And besides that, it is believed by some people that the Dead Sea Salt helps you really deal with anger, but not just anger in the present, but anger back through the generations that you know a person with illness might be carrying, not just things from their lifetime, but I might be carrying things from previous lifetimes, previous generations of anger that might have been passed down to me. Uh, many believe that the Dead Sea Salts in particular help clear that kind of anger and that kind of holding from the body. Another thing about the Dead Sea, about all the salts, is they help soften things. So when I'm in the bathtub, a lot of times I go when I'm in pain and things have temporarily hardened. And then I go and I sit in the bath and all of a sudden things aren't that soft right in this moment, but things become spongy. And I can actually, when it's actually happening, I can actually push and it, it gets bouncy here. 
I love when that happens. And the salts help soften sitting in the bath in actually either salts, the Epsom salts or the Dead Sea salts help um, soften things. So I get this bouncy feeling, which again helps reduce pain and creates the flexibility for me, my body to adjust to whatever happens to be going on. So both salts are effective, the Epsom, Epsom sea salts and the Dead Sea salts. It's just the Dead Sea comes from a um, healing body of water, the Dead Sea, and has certain elements in it that are not found anywhere else in the world, any other body of water in the world. And it is at least believed by some people that the Dead Sea salts help um, with anger, not just from the present generation, but anger that might be carried, carried from previous generations. Both salts are excellent to use. I combine both. I have, I use a, a five pound bucket of the Dead Sea salts and I combine it with, this is one pound of Epsom salt, I combine it with two. So I soak in seven pounds of salt, which is a huge amount, way, way more than what is recommended. But right now my body seems to like it. It's rather expensive, so I'm hoping, you know, sometime in the near future, my body will be asking not for quite so much salt, but I go overboard. I'm like, when I take, an, when I take a salt bath, I take a salt bath. So I soak in seven pounds. And you can um, see here, this is in a clear bag. So you can just see it's just salt. This is, uh, you know, finely ground. This is from the Dead Sea, but the Epsom sea salts look to the eye, you know, very similar. So the other um, tool, non-medicine tool that I use, well, one of the other is hot water bottles. And I can fill them with water and place them on my tummy wherever I feel that they're needed. And the hot water bottles again start to soften things. And it's not just the heat because the heating pad doesn't do it. There's something about the water that's in the actual water that's in the hot water bottle has a certain buoyancy and it's my opinion that the buoyancy of the water reminds the body of its own capacity to be buoyant and buoyancy is good because it means uh, flexibility it means lightness it means fluidity it means movement so we like buoyancy so the heat helps to relax but like I said, it's not just the heat, it's the buoyancy. And then once things relax, again, everything can move, everything can adjust, you know, flexibility, everything, things can begin to resolve themselves because there's space to move. So I'm going to um, move over to the massage table and do a little demonstration of how I use the um, hot water bottles and how I combine it with massage. So using the massage, the hot water bottles is pretty basic. You take the hot water bottle, you fill it with hot water and you place the bottles on your body wherever you feel the pain. Sometimes I will mix boiling water with the tap water to get the temperature to rise a little higher, but you have to be careful because sometimes you might not feel how hot the temperature is when you first put the hot water bottle on your body, and then all of a sudden, a minute or two, your skin might be burning, so you have to pay a lot of attention, but that's where these... Uh, handy washcloths come in handy because you can take the washcloth and lay it on the body 
and it creates an extra buffer between your skin and the hot water bottle. And then when the hot water bottle starts to cool off, you can remove the washcloth so that you can then increase the amount of heat your body's receiving. So the hot water bottles help, again, relax what the area. Right now it's on my abdomen, so it helps my whole abdomen relax. And again, it's not just the heat, it is the um, buoyancy of the water that is in the hot water bottle. And that buoy the buoyancy of the water helps remind the body of its capacity to be buoyant. And buoyant is good, because buoyancy means fluidity, movement, flexibility, and all those good things that we are trying to cultivate. So I'm going to sit up and do a little demonstration. After the um, hot water bottle or an Epsom sea salt bath, which have both softened things, then it's a really good time to do a massage because the body's soft and flexible and spongy and it can is in the optimal state to benefit from massage. So I am going to touch my body, but this is in no way an erotic demonstration. I actually wish that it was an erotic demonstration because it would mean that uh, I had great capacity in you know, the breast area of my body, which I don't at this point. So for massage, basically, um, I just very gently, you know, move. I tend to move in circular motion through the whole area. And I get into my breast and I move into the liver and down into the whole belly. And so after I take my Epsom bath or my Dead Sea bath, I always do this. And this is when I really feel the most relief. I feel more relief from the massage than I do from the bath. And the same thing with the hot water bottles. The hot water bottles feel good, but it's ultimately the massage that helps me the most. And I'm going to turn around over here to say that um, the massage is very important because when I first started in my healing, I wouldn't touch my body. My own body repulsed me. And I had tumors growing everywhere that you could see. I had one in my heart, one on my left breast, you know, tumors in my body that you couldn't see. And I didn't want to touch my body. And the thing that was going to help me the most was movement. And the thing that was going to hurt me the most was stagnation. And by not touching my body, I was creating a huge amount of stagnation. And shortly after I returned from Mexico for the immune therapy, things had reached such a point that I was not able to get out of bed. I mean, it was just, I couldn't move. And my mom was with me and we said, okay, it's either bedpan or hospital because I couldn't get out of bed on my own. I mean, things had gotten so rigid, things had gotten so stagnant that I couldn't move. I could not get my own body out of the bed. And I called my naturopath oncologist and he said, Laura, you know, emotions amplify everything. And he told me to, um, you know, basically to start, gave me some techniques to start moving the energy and to start breathing because I wasn't even aware that I was so clenched, I wasn't breathing. And I started doing some um, subtle movements, which is going to be in segment three on, it's going to be on movement. And I eventually Get out, got myself out of the bed. And this huge light bulb went off, which was, 
that stagnation creates illness and um, what would be the word? Movement creates healing and that things have to flow in the, in the areas in which the illness exists if I want to heal. And I had to find ways to create openings, to create space, to create fluidity, to create flexibility. These are key words that you're going to hear me repeat over and over and over again because they equal healing. Flexibility, fluidity, movement equals healing. Stagnancy equals illness and ultimately equals death. Things have to move. And so I had to learn to get to know my tumors, which, believe me, was not exactly the most fun process. And I had to start to embrace my body. And circulation, that's the word I was looking for. I had to create circulation. Um, and I had to stop the stagnancy in any way possible. And that was the earliest beginning of this transformation from stagnancy to circulation. Stagnancy equals illness and leads to death, and circulation leads to healing and health and life. So on that note, I'm going to conclude segment three, which is on I'll, con I'll summarize Epsom sea salts and dead sea salt baths and how they help relax the body, they help with detoxification, and they help releasing of emotions, particularly intense emotions, both from this lifetime and possibly from previous generations that have been emotions that have been passed down. And then the hot water bottles, which also deal with help relax and create fluidity and um, in the body and both of those both the hot water bottles and the Epsom sea salt baths prepare the body to receive the maximum benefit from massage so that we have instead of um, so that we can move from stagnation to circulation so on that note, I will conclude segment three. Segment four, we're actually now going to go into movement. We're going to go into um, impulse movement and a little bit of yoga. And that's what's in store for segment, um, which segment are we on? Four? Losing count. That's what's in store for segment four. So uh, if you need to take a break, please do. But please come back because we have uh, two more segments and they're all tied together. So thank you so much for being with me and um, I will catch you in a moment. Thank you. So welcome to segment four of From Helplessness to Empowerment. So Helplessness to Empowerment is the name of this video. But I think I will give this segment its own name from stagnancy to circulation and through movement. So I'm going to talk a little bit about yoga and then I'm going to talk a little bit about impulse movement, which are the two ways that I move my body to help circulation, to help shift from stagnancy to circulation. So I'm not a yoga teacher or even an experienced yogi, so I'm not going to um, spend a lot of time, but I'm just going to demonstrate some of the moves that I do. So for example, twists are really good, I've told for, the, for digestion. And as I lay here, I can feel the stretch, particularly right along this area and I can feel my breath expanding, again, primarily in this area. 
and we switch to the other side. Oh, this side I feel my hip a lot, and I feel the breath more in the side of my body, right in here, it's where I feel the stretch. Yeah, right in here. And another pose I like to do, I use a strap to stretch my calves and my hamstring muscles. And you just kind of go raise your leg and you keep the bottom leg straight and you just hold it there and the calf muscle and this the hamstring muscle get a really good stretch in this position and of course what you do on one side you want to be sure to do on the other side ah it actually feels good right now to uh, feel those areas of my body stretching. So yoga has been around, I don't know how many thousands of years and it's a prescribed set of positions and postures. And again, I'm not gonna go into it more than I just did because I'm not a yogi, I'm not a yoga teacher. Um, but I wanted to just do a brief demonstration to show how you can use yoga, that yoga can be used as a tool to help open spaces, stretch, and create opportunity for there to be circulation in areas that might have been constricted. In addition to yoga, I like to do what I call impulse movement. And impulse movement differs from yoga in that you're not following a prescribed set of postures. You're simply listening to the body and you're moving by impulse. You're letting, you're tuning into the body and you're feeling where does the body want to move? And then you hold it there. So right now I feel a big stretch right here. You hold it there I might be here for a while until the next impulse arrives and tells you where to move. Impulse movement, my, what I call impulse movement, is really, um, I got a lot of my education from continuum and from authentic movement, which both emphasize this kind of organic movement not a prescribed routine and so um, a lot of what I do is based on my experience through my training in continuum and authentic movement and so now I'm just going to take a brief minute or two to go into my version what I call impulse movement so I felt the, move, the urge to move and then the urge stopped here. So I'm just gonna hold this position until I feel an impulse to move. I feel a lot of stretching and opening in certain areas, but I don't wanna move from the position to show you. but basically a lot in my right armpit. I feel a big opening. And I'm feeling the impulse to move my right leg and I'm just gonna move it. And my, until, and now I'm feeling the move to, m impulse to move in the other direction. Oh, I feel the stretch, feels good. Mm. And now I'm gonna hold this until I get an impulse. 
to move. Impulse is coming, and I feel a need to move, bow down, and now I'm feeling the impulse to open. And I can really feel a lot of opening in my belly right here. back to sitting position just to talk for a moment or two about this. So I was moving only when my body truly was telling me to move. I call it the impulse. And when the impulse wasn't there, I would just hold myself in static position and wait for the next impulse. And what happens when I move in this fashion is uh, similar to yoga. You know, things open, places that are tight, open, uh, constriction releases, and space, you know, there's stretching, and space, and, you know, flexibility, all these good things um, uh, can now begin to transpire in the body. The biggest difference between impulse movement, in my opinion, and yoga is that in yoga you follow a set of prescribed postures and, and movements. In impulse movement, you're, you're really tapping into the body's own inner wisdom and it's telling you, if you listen, exactly what it needs in every moment. So I might be here, my body's saying, oh, that feels good, and I hold it, and it says, okay, I've had enough of that, now let's try this. So every movement is in alignment with the body's desires. You have to tune in, though, and you have to listen. So that's kind of the difference um, in the impulse movement everything everything flows from from inner inner wisdom the body's inner wisdom the body's desire in the moment and you tune into that and you move with that in yoga um, is a an art that's been around thousands of years of positions and postures that have known to be profoundly effective and you do those poses and in whatever way serves your body in your own personal practice. Both are, in my opinion, it's just my opinion, both are very effective ways to move from stagnation to circulation. And circulation uh, means health and stagnation leads to illness. So we definitely want circulation and so I think that concludes segment which numbers do I keep forgetting segment five segment four which is on movement I always like to do a little summary it's on movement and particularly yoga and impulse movement and how those movement practices can aid the body in moving from stagnation to circulation by creating space, by stretching, by creating opening, by creating fluidity and flexibility. All those good words that are becoming like my best friends. Let's see, uh, fluidity, 
uh, flexibility, opening, stretching. I can't remember the other words, but they're what? Circulation. Oh, circulation. Stuart, my cameraman's helping me out. Circulation. Um, they're all, all those words are my new best friends because they all are essential, just critical to the healing process. And these movement, particularly the impulse movement, gave me the power to move from invalid <laughs> to mobile. <laughs> I have a lot of, <laughs> from invalid to mobile. That's a, that's a pretty good, that's a nice shift. So I was laying in bed, um, ready for either the bedpan or the hospital, and by listening to my body and doing the impulse movement, I got out of my bed on my own and walked to the bathroom. And that was the beginning of this journey. So we have, let's see, we have from, from helpless to empowerment, we have from stagnancy to circulation, and we have from invalid to mobile. So I think those are um, whichever uh, level of shift you want to focus on, um, they all lead to the same thing, which is health and healing. And on that note, I will conclude segment four, and we will move to segment five, which is rebounding on a mini trampoline, and um, which also helps with uh, circulation and many other things. And um, I will look forward to meeting you um, at the site where we've set up the rebounders. So thank you again for um, participating with me in this um, exploration of my healing. To be continued, thank you. So welcome to segment five, which is uh, rebounding. Rebounding um, helps with uh, circulation and interestingly enough, it helps, it's similar to the hot water bottles and that it helps with buoyancy because having a, a liver as enlarged as I do is, requires ongoing daily care. And one of the best ways to help is to get, things get um, uh, stagnant and, and stuck, nothing moves, the liver is not happy. But if we can get things fluid and buoyant, then we can begin to make the liver happy. And rebounding, the bouncing, the, there's a buoyancy to how you hit the rebounder and you spring into the sky and you bounce back and you spring into the sky that creates a sense of buoyancy in the body. And also just this movement it's like you're taking the liver and you're gently shaking it. And as you shake it, obviously things start to move. So you got this solid, hard thing, and you take it and you're gently shaking it. And all of a sudden, things start to move a little bit. And things start to move a little bit more, and the liver starts to become a happy liver. So I have special rebounder that has, instead of the springs, the metal, the metal springs that you normally see, these are actually bungee cords. So it makes it even more buoyant because it's, you hit more gently and you rise more gently because the rebounders stretch in a more softer way. That's not proper grammar, <laughs> but in a softer way than, a, than a metal, you know, spring does. And on that note, I'm just going to do a little demonstration. You can do, on the rebounder, you can, um, your feet don't even have to leave the ground. Um, you can do whatever you feel capable of doing in any particular day. So some days, if you have a lot of energy, you can bounce and you can reach for the heavens. And other days, when you have less energy, you can keep your feet on the ground. So I'll give an example. So here, I'm not even lifting my feet or not lifting the rebounder, but my whole 
all this area is feeling the buoyancy of up and down, up and down. And that buoyancy is creating an enormous amount of fluidity and circulation. It's just bouncing it. And it's, it's one of the most effective ways to get circulation and movement in these areas that become so tight and so rigid. And I don't have to do anything more than this to get effective results. Get on here, and I just, I rebound 10 minutes a day, and that's enough for me. And after being in bed for a year, I've been rebounding pretty much daily for over a month. I think I've skipped two days. But 10 minutes is enough. If I did more than that, it'd be pushing it. And so your feet never have to leave the ground. But if you're feeling a little more energized, then you can, now my heels are leaving the ground, but my balls and my feet are still on. So that gives a little bit more powerful bounce and a little bit more buoyancy and uh, increased circulation. And then you can actually, if you're feeling up to it, you can leave the ground totally. So now my whole foot is leaving the ground and you can twist and you can use your hands and get a little upper body strengthening and you can do jumping jacks and i don't know i think that's my whole bag of tricks <laughs> i kind of do that in a little series that in combination easily oh wait i forgot you can jog you can jog on the rebounder and you can use your arms again to when you use your arms, you help elevate your heart rate. And you also get um, a little bit of upper body exercise. I'm kind of proud of myself that I'm able to actually talk and rebound at the same time. So this concludes my, well, it doesn't include this segment, but I'm going to um, stop rebounding <laughs> in this moment. Ooh, and catch my breath <sighs> and I will say um, just uh, Stuart will you be able to see me if I sit on the rebounder so I'm just gonna have a seat Ooh. and what I want to say is that <laughs> let me get my breath I got my heart rate up Ooh, and I got my my heart, my breath is um, taking big, expansive breaths because I got my heart rate up. So let me take a moment to let my heart rate come back down. What I just want to say is that in addition to circulation, the rebounder is excellent for those people who um, are entering the menopause. It helps build bone strength. And even if you are not in that age, in that age range, um, you know, if, you, if cancer has metastasized to the bones, anything that has to do with the bones, the impact is excellent for bone strengthening. It's obviously good for um, aerobics, getting your aerobic strength and I already said it's good for circulation and in my opinion it's good for mood elevation and oh and lymphatic system oh my goodness it helps drain the lymphatic system because um, most exercises do not the lymphs do not drain from normal exercise even jogging doesn't really help it's this up down and rebounding is one of the best exercises to help the lymphatic system drain. The lymphatic system is what gets all those toxins out of your body. So it really is quite a phenomenal um, piece of equipment and a phenomenal exercise to incorporate into your regime if you're able to. And just to remember that you can start very, very slowly your feet don't even have to leave the rebounder and you can do it for two minutes if that's where you need to start. I always 
always listen to your body um, and you take breaks when you need to and this is one of those times where more is not better it's really just again listening and saying what what does my body want today and what can it handle today and that's the right amount not more than that not less than that and that may change on a daily basis so um, I don't like to give advice but if I were to give advice it would clearly be listen to your body and it, the, your body knows what it needs and if you listen to it it'll tell you but this rebounding can be an enormous support to pretty much any healing journey for the body so I think this concludes segment five, which is rebounding. And we are going to transition to the last segment of this video, which will be on the Beamer, which is a piece of equipment that was designed to help with circulation, with actually microcirculation. And so please uh, stay tuned to learn more about this and then you will have my complete current toolbox of managing pain and shifting from helpless to empowerment and from stagnation to circulation. So um, many blessings and to be continued in segment six. Thank you. Welcome to the last segment of this video, which is the Beamer. And the Beamer, I'm sitting on the mat of the Beamer, which is plugged into a computer over here that can be programmed, that is programmed to uh, send impulses into the mat. And I I wrote it down because it's, it was too hard for me to memorize all this stuff, but the Beamer um, works by increasing what's called microcirculation. And as you know, a big theme of today's video is on circulation, from stagnation to circulation. And the, um, the best way to understand this is to look at the heart. The heart pumps 2,000 2, gallons of blood a day and the organ is about the size of a fist. So the heart can't push all the blood through the body on its own. So it relies on this um, support system that is not widely known of microvessels. And these microvessels help take the blood that's being pumped through the heart and help it get to where it's needed, help you know, deliver all the nutrients, all the things that the blood does when it circulates through the body. So, the, um, just to put this in perspective, that the arteries pump 11.5% of our blood, the veins pump 14.5%, 14 14 and the microvessels pump a whopping 74% of our blood. So, if you want to increase circulation, the best way to do it is actually through microcirculation through those microvessels. That's how 74% of our blood gets circulated throughout the body. And if those, if that system is stagnant, then nothing moves and we create the opportunity for illness to set in because illness loves stagnancy. And um, health thrives on circulation. So pretty much in the most simplest concept, the you lay on this beamer, on this mat, and you program it. You turn it on and you program it. There's 10 levels and each level hits a different system. So level one is the central nervous system. Level 10 is the bones and each one has a primary focus but no matter which level you're on, you are increasing the circulation in your body. Treatment is usually eight minutes, twice a day. 
eight minutes when you wake up in the morning and eight minutes when you go to bed. So it doesn't take a long time. When I first started on the Beamer, it was over a year ago, it was right after I got the news of the metastasized cancer. I had it been sleeping for about six weeks and I was very um, agitated in kind of trauma mode. And one treatment on the Beamer and I slept through the night. So I had a very immediate and dramatic response to the Beamer. I can't guarantee everybody will. I think it's a very, un you know, like everything is very unique and very personal, so we all have different experiences. But I've had a very positive experience with the Beamer. And now that I'm dealing with my enlarged liver and um, pain management, the Beamer's also helping with the pain management because it starts, it gets things circulating. And when there's circulation, there's less pain. So I would say the Beamer with me helps with my sleep. It helps calm my central nervous system, which is probably why I sleep better. And it helps with pain management also because the circulation starts to allow for movement and to provide for relief. And for me, the Beamer is known to help with many other things as well but I'm just sharing those things that I use it for and where I've seen the most impact. And I'm now just going to um, just lay down on the Beamer just so you can see what it looks like, but it's basically a mat that's plugged into a computer. And I turn the computer on and I pu punch in which level I wanna use, level one through level 10. And then I lay down and I just let the Beamer do its thing. Some people feel nothing on the Beamer. I usually feel kind of subtle sensations throughout my body. Sometimes I feel a lot, sometimes I feel a little, but how much you feel is not an indication of how much it's impacting your body. Some people feel nothing while they're receiving treatment but they still receive the benefits and they notice the difference in their energy or whatever the particular symptom is that they're using the Beamer for. So I'm just going to go uh, lie down now.